Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Omar Ishraq. Thank you all very much, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to moderating the session, but let me start with um, a few things. You know, this, this session is about technology, uh, technology in healthcare. And um, the uniqueness of technology in healthcare is that in this situation, the actual difference that technology makes can actually be measured and seen. That's not, that's in many ways different from general technology that we all use every day in our day-to-day -day lives, where it's an emotional assessment of the value of technology. Here it's real. It's real, but we don't always make it real because we don't measure it in quantitative terms and we don't deploy it in quantitative terms. But the fact is that technology in healthcare always has a purpose, a very definitive purpose that's meant to help people. And this video that you just showed put in another angle to that. It said that while all of that is true, there's true emotion involved in everything that we do in healthcare. It affects people, and we heard a very, very touching story there from, from Matt, who, who I'm gonna welcome here in a minute. But it is about people, it's about inspiration that we all get from helping other people, uh, and it's about making a real difference in people's lives. So, you know, we stand in healthcare in an inter interesting position where we apply technology expertise. You know, many of us are deep in technology. We get interested in it, we have fun with it, and that in its own right is, uh, is a great experience and something that people uh, live their lives developing and enjoying and contributing. But at the same time, it makes a measurable difference about which there is no question. And, 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 and associated with all of that, there's true inspiration, emotion tied with it. So we live in a unique industry. The other thing that I'll say before I invite everyone over is that the confounding thing about this industry, which seems to be so, um, you know, such a great place to work in and contribute and only do good things and valuable things, is that it's viewed as a cost burden to the entire world. It's viewed as a problem. It's viewed as, uh, you know, you're making people better, but it costs more money. And I think that's because we don't look at it comprehensively. We don't look at data in a very specific way. We don't measure outcomes systematically. We don't apply the right therapy to the right patient in a systematic and disciplined way. And because we don't do that, there's a lot of variation. And that variation causes the cost to escalate. And instead of healthcare being viewed as an economic driver for the world, which it should be, it's viewed as a cost burden. And I really place it on all of us, in our own way, to first be cognizant of that and then address it. Address both the, the value that we create in terms of better outcomes, but also the cost that it requires to create a, that value. And in fact, it should be lowered with better outcomes as opposed to an inherent belief that technology simply costs money. So that's some words. And we'll talk uh, much more about that. Before I invite the panel over, I do want to recognize Joe, Joe Kiani, who, um, who launched this movement. And um, you know, over the years, it's, it's gathered more and more steam, Joe. It's becoming, uh, it's highly recognized right now. This is the first time it's international. Uh, and so you should be proud. You should be proud of what you've done here. And thank you, Joe, for, 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 for creating this. Thank you. So with that, uh, let me ask the uh, panel to uh, come on over and take a seat, and then we'll, we'll start from here. <clears throat> okay, so welcome to all of you, and let me spend a few minutes saying a few words about uh, each of our panelists here. And let me start with Matt, Matt Darling, who we just uh, saw on the video. But, um, you know, Matt's um, a, a serial inventor and a co and the, uh, and the co-founder of, of Smart Ward, Ward, which is a company uh, whose mission is to improve patient safety and job satisfaction of all clinical professionals. And I, I think you saw, I got a hint of, of what he does. In the, in the video that we just saw. By background, uh, Matt has had a long and successful career in IT, 
and he's worked in a range of commercial projects and also been a senior advisor to the government. Um, you know, people often ask uh, why healthcare, why health spends so much money on IT systems without seeing any benefit, and the answer is that, like I mentioned earlier, health is unique in that uh, the, the technology will continue to change. And I think Matt has recognized that and he's built a system in SmartWord that is, um, that is flexible and that's moving along using the latest technologies in artificial intelligence, which uh, we'll, we'll hear about soon. So, so welcome to the panel, Matt. Okay. Second, I have um, uh, Dr. Charles Murphy, who is the Chief Patient Safety Officer at Inova Heart and Vascular Institute in the United States. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a Duke-trained cardi cardiothoracic surgeon and a, and a critical care physician. And after being a cardiothoracic surgeon for 17 years, he returned to Duke as the medical director of the um, cardiac uh, ICU and uh, step-down units. He also served as a physician lead for quality with the Duke uh, Heart Center in the Department of Surgery. Um, he then became associate chief patient safety officer for the Duke Health System and he's currently the Chief Patient Safety Officer at the Innova Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, and he continues to be uh, active in the direct patient care in, in the critical care settings. I know Innova very well, and it's a, it's a great institution, and um, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here. You. Next. <laughs> Next, I have Franz, Franz van Helten, who's the CEO of Royal Philips, and it's a position that he's held since uh, April 2011, and he's also the chairman of the board of management and the executive committee. Uh, Franz is passionate about innovation, uh, about also about uh, entrepreneurship and business transformation, and he certainly uh, led Philips uh, to, uh, a lot of, through a lot of change. Uh, but in it, it's very clear that his dedication to leadership and healthcare technology and to make the world healthier and more sustainable, that's very clear. They've got clear goals at Philips, uh, a very impressive one of improving 3 billion lives by the year 2025, and I think Franz himself set that goal and passionately believes in it and drives towards it. Uh, by way of history, uh, Franz uh, first joined Philips in 1986, and he held multiple positions uh, in the company, including uh, co-CEO of Consumer Electronics. Uh, he also led the successful Philips spin-off of NXP Semiconductors, and then he... Uh, did some consultancy, was a senior advisor to the board of, uh, of Dutch financial services business, ING, the ING Group, where he was responsible for the separation of the company's banking and insurance activities. And then since then, uh, Franz uh, has been running uh, Philips, and he's got this Accelerate program uh, focused on customers, but the thing that I've seen the most uh, from Franz is that he's got a real focus on healthcare and uh, making Philips into a broad-based uh, and dedicated uh, healthcare company in a, in a very impressive and forthright fashion. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. And then finally we have Anders, and Anders uh, and I go back a long ways. I've, I've known Anders for many years. Uh, he's currently the, uh, let's see, his official title is President and CEO of Clinical Care Solutions at GE Healthcare. And it's a $5 billion business with 5,000 employees worldwide. Um, the Clinical Care Solutions uh, provides clinicians and frontline caregivers with a variety of medical solutions, including ultrasound, which is the most important one, and <laughs> monitoring technology. That's only because Anders and I worked in ultrasound for many years. That's just a joke. <laughs> Mo monitoring technology, maternal infant care, anesthesia, respiratory care, and cardiology. Anders joined uh, GE in 1998 through the acquisition of uh, Diasonic's VimMed uh, ultrasound into GE and uh, he's got a lot of experience in the ultrasound industry, uh, traveled around the world, lived globally in uh, Singapore, Paris, and Norway. Um, he was named the president and CEO of the clinical care solutions business in 2016, but prior to that, uh, since 2009, he, he played a leading role and led the ultrasound business. I also have to mention that, uh, you know, Anders is actually celebrating because Anders is, uh, used to be the coach of the Norwegian ski team and the Norwegian ski team has had a field day, as it always does, in the Winter Olympics. So that's what we've <laughs> So with that, let's get down to a discussion. And um, I'm going to start, um, actually, uh, by, um, you know, reflecting on the perspective that I just gave about healthcare being um, a broad-based um, uh, technology uh, th that's affecting patients at different stages. 
And I'm going to start with France because France, you know, you uh, see healthcare uh, both from a consumer angle, you see healthcare in a critical care angle, you see healthcare uh, after the patient has left the hospital. So you have a, you have a pretty good view of the entire spectrum, especially as it relates to patients and their journey through the system. So maybe a few words to your own reflection and thoughts about that. Thanks, uh, Omar. Um, yeah, back to the introduction, we decided to dedicate Philips to health technology only because there's so much to do. So we got rid of all our other businesses, but we kept, we kept hospital and consumer health technology because in our strategic vision, which we adopted um, several years ago, we said we need to put the patient at the heart of everything we do. And if you see health as a continuum from healthy living to preventative situations to diagnosing first time right to, let's say, a, a, a intervention that is first time right and then the transition back to the home that needs to be, again, seamless and safe and then help the patient recover back to a healthy life, you, you, I've now laid out a continuum thinking that is, that is centered around people rather than around institutions. Right? If we think of the world as institutions, then there are walls, then there are departments, then there are divisions. Even within our own companies, yes. you know, there are divisions. So that's by definition wrong. But if you take a philosophical point of view that it's us, people, that somewhere through our lives we transition from healthy to sick back to healthy, then we need to enable those transitions to go perfect. Right? And this is where we have said we need to work much more horizontally rather than vertically. You still need to have your expertise, let's say, in ultrasound or in you know, MR machines yeah, or yeah. in surgical equipment. Um, but if we can enable that that flow of the patient is faster, better, um, better outcomes, lower cost, in fact, embracing the quadruple aim, then you go a lot better. So what we have then, of course, discovered is that data is essential uh, and data needs to flow easily. And we will talk about interoperability in a moment. Uh, because along all those stages and departments and expertise that needs to be brought together, we need to have a seamless collaboration uh, between specialists in, in an appropriate contextual manner. Right. So Philips has uh, evolved into much more a health informatics company where now uh, over 25% of the company uh, is uh, in around integration of data, supporting care flows and care pathways and supporting and enabling people to live better. And so come back to the consumer versus hospital uh, it is all about the person. And if the world cannot afford to pay for acute care as much, then we need to put in more money uh, and more resources around prevention and chronic disease management. Mm -hmm. And that is happening around people's homes. Yes. And, then, and then we need to ab adopt behavioral science and even gamification to influence how people live because then is how you influence them on maybe a different lifestyle or on medication compliance. Um, and then we need to find ways to connect doctors to patients in new ways. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We live in a digital age. So it's fascinating because now finally we can tear down, tear down all the silos and all the walls and, and make people more effective. So that's in a nutshell, you know, yeah. what, what no, drives that's, me. That's, that's good. That's a good broad uh, overview of what we face, both the opportunity as well as the challenge of overcoming some of these barriers. L let me go to Dr. Murphy because, um, you know, while you can have a perspective, I'm sure you're occupied as a clinician in the moment on an individual patient and a very specific problems. And at that point, how the patient was managed before or how the patient is going to be managed after is almost secondary to you because you've got to pay, save the patient's life there and then. So, so how do you drift in and out of that focus in time, of that point in time, and at the same time have time to think about, you know, some of this happened because, you know, the progression was wrong, or I'm going to release the patient and then I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so your thoughts on this whole 
Well, I'd like to share a bit of a vision to highlight some of those um, issues. So uh, in healthcare, um, the vision is that we'd love to see safety built into and designed into the system. So I think about human factors being incorporated. Uh, and I think that that's exceedingly important. We don't have that to the same level as other safety critical industries uh, have. Number two, I think that um, we want technology to re really help us provide better care. So we don't want siloing of information and we don't want to have onerous burdens of documentation. Uh, we want uh, excellent early warning systems and my teams want more time with the patient and the families. We need great teamwork and communication. Uh, we need uh, excellent uh, clinical decision support. Uh, we need transitions and handoffs that work across that care continuum. We need increasing use of simulation so that we've practiced things before we see these things occur. We need to have monitoring across the care continuum into the outpatient world. And then we need to have uh, timely intervention so that we get the best outcomes. Uh, we also, you know, ever since the Institute of Medicine report came out, we need gl a global reporting system where we can learn from harm and near misses. And I hate to say this one, but we actually need for people to do hand hygiene every time. A and then uh, finally, you know, I do have a vision where we do have a world with zero preventable harm uh, based on those things. And, and I think having that shared vision of these things uh, is very important and the nice thing for the audience is that everyone on the panel is helping that vision become a reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we've heard about in many ways a need uh, which was described very well by, by uh, both France and, and Dr. Murphy uh, but you've got to fulfill the need and, and I'm going to turn to Matt first and then Anders but Matt you know as you and as, as you've already sort of stated in the purpose for your own company that uh, you need a system which uh, changes over time because it's not only of new technology, but because every patient is different. And because, uh, you know, there's a lot of data that's fluid today. How do you, in fact, use that data for it to become an, an advantage in treatment as opposed to a handicap because you've just got too much information and no one knows what to, do, what to do with it? And what's your approach towards customizing that data so that it really makes a difference in every patient who's different by themselves. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Look, yeah. I think that there's um, some very complex underpinnings to the nature of the problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what I saw was a system under stress where people were working extremely hard and yet people were not really able to deliver the care that they needed to. And that was because of a fragmented uh, information environment. <coughs> And in the time and motion studies we've done and in our research over the last nine years, we've uncovered some really amazing statistics. And one of them is that the fragmentation in the information environment has led to a number of really troubling elements. Uh, one of them is that people need to work around rather than work with the system. So there's a big systemic problem. And that workaround, and I alluded to in, in, the, in the video around how there were records there that did not reflect the care that had been delivered and that was basically uh, regarded by people as a necessary evil in order to get everything done. Mm -hmm. So systems have to be made that people can work with instead of around. And through that prism, we can make uh, improve data quality greatly. For me, the, the necessity of, of workflow to provide the support so that people know what to do, you know, when and to whom, without having to think too hard about it, is like a, you know, really vital because if we can do that, then we can have accurate data. And accurate data is really the key to unlocking this whole puzzle. If we want to, to move to zero death by 2020, I think it's achievable, but only if we have accurate data. And so information systems have to be there to remove the levels of admin. So if you look at a hospital, it's overall resources, more than 50% will go on admin. And that's because of that fragmentation that I mentioned. Um, we need, there have been so many fantastic ideas at this conference, but the system is really, really burdened with uh, a lot of busy work. It's not adding enough value. And in order to see those ideas implemented, we actually have to create some flex. And the way we can create flex is by automating admin through, you know, simplifying the information environment with good IT systems. And, and intelligence built into those IT systems, I assume. Yes. To make it fluid. 
Yeah, so the, the system needs to present the information the user needs at the time. You can't have the user burrowing. A lot of the current IT systems represent what I would depict as a mechanization of a process. So mm -hmm. it's a computerized version of a paper thing. But computers are infinitely more powerful and subtle than that if they're used correctly. Yeah, yeah I'll come back to some of that. But let me, let me go to Anders next, because Anders, you know, the the... We talked a lot about data, about overall patient management, uh, and about the flow of the patient through a healthcare system. Uh, but health technology, in the end, is technology. You, you're inventing something or coming up with something that, that affects uh, a patient in a very specific way. What difference that actually makes in the overall care of that patient can sometimes get lost, mm -hmm. in that you get so enamored with what one new type of measurement or data gives you and the quality of that, that the relevance of that in the overall system can get buried. So how have you learned to uh, kind of manage that and, and therefore select which technology is important, which is not, and how do you, how do you optimize these things? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good uh, way of putting it, and I think it goes back to a little bit of the silo discussion. <coughs> we have single data, uh, spot data, spotting, and, and very often, decisions are made uh, too late. At the point where it's too late and you, you, you have a single parameter, etc. We are not able to co uh, put those uh, parameters together. So that's, that's one area. So if you want to take all the data, make it liquid as, as much as we can, and put them together. If you can do that, and then take a few steps back and, and build an artificial intelligence to make it predictive. So you can early do the early warnings. And that, I would say that's probably one of the better ones. And <clears throat> for instance, we have a, we have an, a project going on with, with Roche, which is really not a, is a, a device company. They are sitting in basically in, in, in another side and getting a ton of clinical data. Well, we have imaging, we have monitoring, we have anesthesia, a lot of different things. So we have this uh, project uh, trying to solve the problem of sepsis, which is an individual uh, kind of loss control over in, infectious disease. Um, and if we then build uh, a backbone, a digital backbone with multi-parameters to do early predictions, that's where we can put these data together to, to, make, to help the nurse basically make an, an early uh, decision or an early warning. Today, they are like 85% of all the alarms are unnecessary. A nurse walks three to four miles every day, so it's part of Matt's your problem. They didn't have time. Mm. because they were attending 85% unnecessary alarms. Yeah. So if you can do early prediction and, and put multi-parameters together, we have a chance to m do, do this, uh, drive more efficiency, efficacy we will go up and it will help us to, to in many ways. So that's from the data point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's an example how we work and, and, and think about this. How do you link that to the technology creator, some new uh, sensor or something like that that comes up? Uh, do you, are you finding a way in which you evaluate um, if you have to invest in one version versus the, versus the other? Do you have methods through which you link back to the difference you'll actually make in the world before you start um, investing in that? Are, the, are those mechanisms fluid? Or, and, and how well, I would say it's, it's not, so, not so fluid, but yeah. I, I have to thank the audience here in, in, in many ways because the real work is happening at the clinical side. And yeah. there's a ton of data where, where each individual parameters yeah. are being investigated. We have a new parameter almost every day. Yeah. New things we want to, to track and trace and, and get data into the system. Yeah. Every bed generates a, a one megabyte of data yeah. every day. So it is, we, we're not utilizing it. So how can we do that better? So what do we do from an investment point of view? Look at every single one and then try to, to, to track it back to a disease. Mm -hmm. like the sepsis, for example, yeah, yeah. or combine it so we can have more data points. And that's how we will start to invest in a different way and, okay. and drive productivity from that perspective. Yeah. And Franz, you have a view on this? <coughs> I mean, companies like ourselves, we, we of course, we like to dominate, but that is not the solution here, mm -hmm. right? So w it is absolutely mandatory to have an open environment yeah. with, where systems integration can be achieved and where different equipment from different vendors can be interoperable. Mm -hmm. And for sure, hospitals need to demand that, but it goes wider, it goes even beyond the enterprise. So interoperable, interoperability, very important. Open EMRs, right? 
so that you can write and read to and from the EMR and get the relevant data in a contextual way at the point of care. Again, very important. Um, it needs to be patient-centric because that, in the end, makes it relevant to the care uh, point. And, um, you know, there, there are going to be multiple inventors in the world that will contribute a new piece of technology mm -hmm. that will have to be integrated in that existing environment for it to work well. And I think it is a testimony that we are sitting here with, let's say, competing companies because we believe that this interoperability and systems integration effort is needed. And we have all pledged as part of the patient safety uh, movement that we will adhere to that interoperability. Sure. Uh, and I think we need to lift that even <laughs> higher. I'd yeah. like to add uh, to this point that uh, since the movement started here, uh, there's been a lot of discussions in, in, in our company and, and I think in the industry in general, how we kind of missed the whole thing because we've been so device focused and very individually yeah. focused on different yeah. points. So in, in what really happened here is that if you really look at the data, and this is just take, take you as, as the proxy, every day there's about 700 people dying because of patient mismanagement in some fashion. Regardless, what is that? That's one jumbo jet crashing every day. Do we have the same mm -hmm. awareness? No. no. Yeah. You know, you put that data back to yourself, to your families, whatever. You realize that there is no other question that patient safety is trumping every agenda item. So that's what we have done from a leadership point of view and lifted this all up. And I can't agree more with France. This has to be an industrial kind of action to be taken. Uh, and to do that. We may need some help from the uh, maybe uh, uh, regulatory framework to force a little bit more this to happen. Mm -hmm. Think about what happened with um, HL7, didn't work for anyone. DICOM worked in ultrasound, mm -hmm. but it took multiple years to do that. It mm -hmm. was basically forced by regulatory committees. Mm -hmm. And I think th maybe the movement here and, and scientific committees and the, uh, the, the to create standards. Yeah, to create standards. That's really what yeah. we, we yeah. have to do. Yeah. Dr. Murphy, first, you were going to say something? No? Um, no, I think I agree that with the creating standards, I think it's very important. And I think it's another brilliance of, of Joe is that we really do need patients and families, industry providers, and governments working together to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. But Matt, you're, you're yeah, I think that there is a fundamental, another fundamental issue at stake here, which is, and again, I, one of the first questions I had to ask myself was why has IT failed to deliver in health what has been achieved, as was mentioned on the first day, in things like automotive and, and in aviation? And part of it is the, the ongoing complexity, the, the continuous change. 80% of what we recognise as established clinical practice today is going to change within five years. And when you're building an IT system, you are effectively codifying that. You are codifying that information in a way that can th is then creates a, a, a terrible burden in terms of ma maintaining it, keeping it safe. So a coefficient is needed of safety criticality on the one hand and adaptability on the other hand mm -hmm. to keep pace. So I think new technologies are emerging, but they, you know, like really asking IT to deliver the same things up until now has been kind of impossible. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm going to go back to you, Matt, uh, right now on that subject. Let me pivot a little bit from the interoperability, which we'll come back to, and the overall leadership that's required, to another subject that I've at least been very um, um, curious and interested in, and, and I've put some thought into it. But the usage of artificial intelligence in healthcare, mm. um, that's one, and, and you're beginning to do that. But healthcare is behind other areas. You know, like in automated cars, you name it, there's all kinds of different places where artificial intelligence has been used. And <coughs> healthcare has been tended to be a little, at least from what I've seen, conservative. Yeah. And that is a data quality issue. And, and so. Because of data quality? Well, you, you can't build an AI, like you can't get a machine to learn. If but, the but, but in the consumer world, people are using imperfect data all the time and they're doing all yeah, kinds uh, of well things. I, it depends I, how I imperfect it is. I think it's entirely possible to do it. Mm -hmm. But you need to have well-defined uh, data. I mean, um, that, but for example, for these predictive algorithms around patient safety, mm -hmm. predicting sepsis, predicting heart uh, attacks, you can 
do that hours in advance, mm -hmm. already today. We do that with our, with our Guardian software uh, and clinically validated with data sets from Mayo and many others mm -hmm. uh, and curated uh, and flexible because I, 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 I take exception that IT is always hard coded and therefore from the last century, that's no longer the case. Mm. Um, but you need, so AI is being used. Now AI could be used more. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not black and white, it's being used, it could be used more. And there is a schizophrenia, certainly in Europe, around patient data, mm -hmm. right? If you go, uh, if you're born in one province in Germany and you want to get taken care of 50 kilometers uh, further, you have to be completely rescanned because it's so hard to move the data mm -hmm. <laughs> just from one hospital to the next. That's crazy, right? And where we entrust our financial health to the cloud, already for 20 years, we don't do that for health. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we really need to grow up and make data more accessible, because yeah. then I think the advancement of AI can, can move mm -hmm. and we yeah. can do uh, much more. I'd like to draw a distinction, which I think is very important, and that's the difference between device data and data that comes from human-created records, yes. which is a huge volume of the information, and that's really my focus. So, you know, you have standards, ISO 13485 and so on, and this hasn't been the case with a lot of other health IT, EMR, CDSS and so on, haven't been developed with the same rigour. And I think that's because of this mm -hmm. tension between making something adaptable and agile versus making it safe. Um, so in terms of, you know, kind of uh, Omar's question, I was really trying to focus on, on this sort of, you know, like the delivery of care, which is we had, we did a lot of time and motion studies and we found that the, the records that were created, we had people literally following and recording, creating our own record of care of what was happening, and it was 10% accurate what actually made it into the official record. Yeah, but um, I, I have a slightly different uh, view mm -hmm. as to what are the hurdles. Um, because you can say technology is the hurdle, I'm not so sure. Um, many hospital systems still buy technology by department, right? And if you mm -hmm. buy it by department, you get a departmental solution. A department is a silo. Right? And um, many of the EMRs were not originally set up for patient safety. They were not set up for really patient care. Mm. Uh, we need a care coordination layer uh, in order to bring all the data from all the disparate sources together. And that care coordination needs eventually even to extend beyond the four walls of the hospital towards the skilled nursing facilities, towards the home, because care coordination is a flow and you want to avoid that something goes bad in the transition from an ICU to the general ward, from the general ward to discharge. That's where things go wrong. And again, therefore we need to think much more horizontally. Uh, I think also an opportunity to take with telemedicine to take specialist outlying areas to give that expertise. And I was thinking when you were talking, Omar, I agree, more opportunity for AI, particularly clinical decision support. So, you know, one of the things we haven't talked much about the last couple of days is diagnostic error. But if I don't consider a diagnosis, the likelihood that I'm gonna provide the right treatment to that patient is very low. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's real opportunity to improve clinical decision support. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. now, let me throw out two other points that I'd like your comments on. And I've got a whole list of questions here that, that, <laughs> that I'll, I'll go through some of them. But there's two things uh, I'll throw out and then each of you, you know, feel free to comment on it. You know, the first question that I have is, um, is to do with machine learning. In other words, uh, uh, as opposed to generic data, which is then used to stratify mm. and target certain care pathways, uh, if you then track the journey of a specific patient through the healthcare system and the uniqueness that that patient may have, and then the care that's then provided deviates from the standardized care pathway in a way that's customized to that individual based on their ongoing learning, even during that fairly temporary period that the machine can have. Now, that's been talked about in other areas, and I think that's still early even in the, in the consumer world. But what are your thoughts around machine learning? That's one question, machine learning uh, in healthcare as it's, as it's applied to individual patients and the care pathway deviating because of machine learning. The, the other question that I have is um, non-clinical data, socioeconomic data whether a person is rich or poor, whether they have a family or not, how, how effective and how important 
will that information have to be in deciding the care pathway in addition to the clinical data? So I've got two questions there. Each of you feel free to comment on oh, each one. Okay, I'll, I'll start with one. And right. then, uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's a monumental uh, challenge here. Yeah. We, we have to divide it up in, in, in pieces. Today we do nothing, right? Yeah. And, and, and patients die every day. So <clears throat> we have to make certain that even just at the ward itself or in the ICU or a, a very basic thing, Let's start with simple coupling a couple of parameters and track, start with that before we do the whole care area okay. from patient to individual patient. We have to start with basics and see if it works. We have the, 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 the challenge with the getting data from everywhere. Okay, maybe yeah. we'll start in the institutions. Start in the, maybe in the broad You're saying area. just walk before you run. Just get Absolutely, basics. Absolutely. Talk yeah. to each other first, yeah. get basic things done, uh, then worry about all this fancy stuff. Make certain that self-driven... Yeah. ICU actually works uh, first in, in the basic area and then yeah. expand and maybe pick a couple of care areas first and that's what we did, you know, picking okay. one difficult example to understand what and challenges we have. Focus on that. I, I think that's at least what we try to do and we will need to work very closely with the, with the, with the clinical environment, regulatory environment, because many of these parameters have never been experienced. These decisions are made today by individual physicians or nurses just by experience. Yeah. And there is no scientific, real scientific process behind it. So let's do that first. And then we could go. Well, I have to say, you know, what I think our care is evolving too. You know, now we try to surround the patient with multiple clinical experts that can use algorithms, use evidence-based practice to provide the best care to that patient at that time with that condition. So I think we're evolving as well, but I think this idea that we can support that with machine learning mm -hmm. and such is very powerful and will help us even be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me the challenge is actually the wide end of the funnel. It's actually collecting data that is high quality to underpin all of this machine learning, all of this AI. Um, you know, th that really is the challenge because the, the data quality is pretty poor because people have to work around the record keeping systems. And this generates a systemic problem. We, we kind of have to solve, you need to have authenticated data. We need to know who is entering the data. Rated. We need to know where they're entering the data, who is with them when they're entering the data, uh, how long it took to complete the task. And if we can do that, then we can provide a level of assurance around that data so that we feed in clean information to systems so that we don't get machine learning that has a defect. And then there's lots of data, and what I need is actionable data. Yeah. I need, and it needs to be prevented, presented in a fairly simple way. Right. I mean, I am busy as heck with crashing patients, <laughs> and I need it to sort of hammer me over the head of, Dr. Murphy, you need to consider this yeah. now. Yeah, 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 Th that went back to my earlier question to you, that in the moment, the doctor doesn't care about any of that. They've got, they've got a patient to deal with, and the, and the crisis situation that they have with that patient is the everything. But also the strength of the team, because my team will help me and they'll speak up and say, Dr. Murphy, you know, we think yesterday we had presented that maybe the team would say this patient needs a tracheostomy yeah. right now. And so there's that strength of teamwork as well. Franz? So I, I see an evolutionary path to adopt machine learning and artificial yeah. intelligence. And um, anybody who would say, you know, we'll replace doctors overnight, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the doctors to be front and center with the patient. But the variance in any institution is huge. One doctor versus the other, even within the same institution, that variance is huge. So if you can, through analytics, provide a faster learning curve and, re and reduce that variance, it's going to be great for patient safety. If you provide clinical decision support systems with you know, smart checklists and Dis discerning the deviation from what is good, right? so that you can pick out the patients that require that extra support, then I think that is going to help tremendously to improve patient safety, but also reduce cost and, and outcomes. And, uh, but it will require a data architecture in your institution that is going to be holistic, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you cannot do what I've just said, you know, silo by silo, you will not move the needle enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is where I think we all need to move from a transactional relationship. You know, you have a call for tender, you buy a piece of equipment, I guarantee you, you will prolong the status quo versus a deep partnership approach mm -hmm. uh, where we say, okay, you know, let's reformulate what is your challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have quadruple aim. Okay, so how can technology help with that? 
Right? That is a different question than that historically mm. you may have asked as professionals around, well, I need a piece of kit, and by the way, I need some IT, mm. and then I'm going to put it all together. Well, good luck, mm. right? You will propagate the past, mm. right? So here we need to think of, of a much more wide holistic architecture in how you deliver care. And then you come to the next challenge, again, not a technology challenge, and that is change management. Mm -hmm. We are all people, we all have our habits, we've all learned it in some way, and now we need to change. Okay, That's, and that is a, again, a collaborative effort where we need to say, what got us here will not get us there. Mm -hmm. right? So I think all of these more, much more human sides uh, are more fundamental than, you know, what is the next wave of AI or machine learning, yeah. because I think it will have far more impact on what we all want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But uh, you guys didn't answer the, the second question that I had, the socioeconomic status, and certainly both France and Matt probably have a, have a, have a strong view on that, especially with uh, your experience in the consumer world, yeah, where well you, you, you must be marketing in different ways and you must have learned. Need, Omar, we, we need to distinguish between the healthy person who becomes sick yeah. and uh, the chronic patient who has a known condition. Yeah. Uh, so to start with the latter, the chronic condition, we have over a million patients on uh, COPD and sleep apnea yeah. through the cloud connected to our uh, uh, AI engines. And we can every night see, you know, adherence to medication, you know, was the mask leaking? Uh, and we can connect that to the payer and to the provider. Uh, you, can inv you can imagine that if you apply that to a COPD pathway, then you can avoid rehospitalization. Mm -hmm. So, but this is a relatively curated environment, right? Or where the data that comes from the home and comes from the patient, we know it has relevance, and and we can stratify it and then decide mm -hmm. what needs to happen for that patient. Mm -hmm. If you think about the patient who says, "Oh, I'm not exactly feeling right. I'm going to Google around my condition." I think what we hear from many of you is that actually creates a lot extra work. Now, I think we need to find a way to bring that into, into that's workflow. I yeah. think it's going to help eventually, yeah. but um, I, I, I also hear people struggle with that. Yeah. On how I'm glad you mentioned that though, because we do need to provide better decision support to patients and families and yes. have that be high quality and sort of for that individual as yeah. well. And I think there's, that'll help, actually it'll help a lot. A pro, as a provider, I love to have patients and families come with information. Would you like patients to bring their information? Absolutely. And in what format? Um, <laughs> an iPad or, <laughs> no, I, you know, uh, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. Because I'd love um, to learn that It's usually paper. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, any views? Yeah, <clears throat> look, again, I think, it, uh, you know, the kind of things that we're talking about at the moment, we have to acknowledge where we are today. And today we have a huge number of expert systems. And uh, this leads to this fragmentation of this information environment. You need a complete picture. And the question of how to get there is sort of a vexed one. But I think it does require uh, a couple of things. We, we need to create more room in the system for people to focus on patients rather than the administration. Exactly. Um, and if we can do that, then we basically free up the time to do all of these improvements. At the moment, we're kind of asking people to do things. Um, they're locked into a tactical frame. They, it's like saying to someone, devise me a strategy while they're trying to run up a hill naked and storm a you know, machine gun post. <laughs> you know, they're under constant fire. They're under constant pressure. So for them to function strategically in that moment is incredibly difficult. And uh, there is this, it was Dr. Scheinman the other day who said he'd like to see uh, patient safety at the centre of, of healthcare. And I think when did it become not the centre and why? And the answer is that this fragmentation of the information environment has actually led to a admin being more than 50% of the resources that go into caring for patients in a hospital. And you've got to ask yourself, how did that happen? Well, Mark, can we switch and talk just a tad about leadership in this arena because I think that's a critical issue and I think we need literally hundreds of thousands of leaders yeah. and we need them across the spectrum of the people that are in this room and we need them not only at a global level, we've had some great global leaders over the last uh, couple of days, but we also need every uh, nursing and physician unit director to also be leaders 
in terms of uh, patient safety and uh, what that means, you know, and I, I'm sort of a Kuzis and Posner type of person, so I think modeling the way is very important, inspiring a shared vision, questioning the status quo, uh, appealing uh, to the heart uh, uh, are very important things, and then empowering everybody else on their team to make a difference, but we really need widespread leadership to really mm -hmm. get to the place where we have zero harm. So I'd li like to add one, uh, one, one yes. point on this one, because maybe we, we are missing some components and some contributors to this. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of our, our devices and, and what other regulatory bodies involved here. We, we, we get out of trouble from the regulatory by re very stringent with our development and, and adhere to all the quality things, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens with the equipment, devices, and all of that, same thing from the hospital side, we don't fail as a, a device manufacturer provider, but we'll fail at the patient side. So how can that be? So we are missing a, a complete regulatory overlook of, of, of the whole pathway, maybe the horizontal mm. pathway. Nobody's really looking at that whole story. You want more regulatory I don't want, I want them as part of the team to work because I think it's siloed so much across the board. If you can get that collaboration going and that's part of the leadership you're bringing up, mm -hmm. that's the leadership challenge I think we have more because within the businesses and in this industries, at the clinical side, I think there's more than enough knowledge, but we need to open that pathway. So, so let me just pivot to a question which is linked to that. The, the, you know, there's many questions here, and I, pr I certainly can't go through all of them, but there's one overriding theme across many of them, which is the, the connection to the EMR systems. And that historically, at least, there's a view that these EMR systems were customized, they're not interoperable, and they're viewed as, a, as an issue. Uh, and, um, and none of you represent, you know, whole-scale EMR companies. There are two big ones. Uh, so what... In, in the U.S. In yeah. the U.S., that's correct. Sorry There's about that. There's a world yeah. outside of the U.S. There's a world outside <laughs> the U.S. Too. In the U.S., <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. And we are here. outside the U.S. right now. <laughs> 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 but but, uh, but on that point, can this really be done without uh, getting the EMR companies on board in this, I mean, in this table? Well, I think we, speaking about regulation, I think it needs to be mandated that, that so it's a mandate. say all IT vendors, whether it's an EMR company or yeah. us in patient uh, you know, critical care, that you have open APIs right? yeah. so that there is no locked-in situation. And but, you know, we've been talking Historically, about yeah. EMR, let's say, was designed much more from a claim perspective, right? right? And uh, so where did we f lose the patient? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where we lost the patient. And the yeah. provider. And um, <laughs> now, <laughs> <laughs> as, we, uh, as we see, uh, let's say hospital consolidation, the bill that comes with, let's say, the EMR integration is huge. Mm -hmm. right? And it's sad because that money is not necessarily going to better patient care. Yeah. Um, and we have made it uh, not a secret to say that we advocate for a thin layer of care coordination as an IT layer above the EMR mm -hmm. so that every enterprise, whether it's a primary care or an emergency responder or a hospital, they can have their own, let's say, administrative environment. Mm -hmm. But somewhere we need an interoperable patient care coordination uh, in order to uh, go across. And I think that is what, in your nice movie, you, 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 you uh, vo vocalized. Well, yeah, I mean, I think ni over nine years of research, the importance to me is very, you know, needs to be focused on evidence. If you look at the, there was a report done by Ostrovsky et al. out of MIT, and they reviewed the top 103 health IT projects in the US and found that there was an evidence base for the claims they made about their benefits for only two. Mm -hmm. Now that's a problem that because is, you have yeah. a excellent salesmanship and poor delivery. Mm -hmm. And those things, you know, that's a diabolical combination mm -hmm. and it has led to a lot of money being taken away, in my view, from patient care. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time to wrap up. I'm gonna just go around the, um, the, 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 the panelists here with a very simple question that I request you answer really, 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 in, a, in a summarized fashion. And the simple question is this, that uh, you know, we've talked a lot. I mean, if there's one big theme that came out here, it's interoperability, working together, working as, a, uh, as in uh, changing the way in which we deal with each other, not 
only in this panel, but with providers, with governments, in a more holistic way. Uh, I think everyone signed up to that in principle, but it isn't that easy to do. And so the question that I have is that in your own estimation, how long a journey is this before we really move the needle in being able to work together? Is it a year, is it five years, is it 10 years? So you wanna start, Matt? Mm -hmm. Look, I think we can start today. Uh, from oh, when will you reach the end? That's what I mean. Or reach it when you well, move there will the never needle. be an end because as yeah. data quality improves and research gets better, okay. there'll be... So in a year, you, be, you think all the time you're making a difference? I think that's, yeah, I think that that's right. I think so that people continuing. are making steady progress at the moment, yeah. but quantum, sh quantum leaps are needed in terms of, you know, this element of data quality, adaptability. And that's how long away, do you think? Yeah, it is, for sure. There are systems that can triple the amount of time being spent on, on patient care and the ward okay. just by automating the admin. Mm -hmm. That's been proven in research. How about you? I think there needs to be a sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know um, that I really can give a time frame. I think it'll be a st uh, steady, 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 change. steady uh, journey over time, but I'm optimistic and, um, that, and that we can get to the goal of zero preventable harm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Franz? What do you think? Well, I'm optimistic about healthcare systems, hospital systems, uh, getting a handle on this. Yeah. Um, but let's face it, much of the patient safety issues are not in the hospital, but also mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. and in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a little bit less optimistic, optimistic about you know, how fast a capacity will be rolled out in emerging markets where still, you know, uh, a mother and child infant, uh, you know, infant mortality in Africa is six, seven percent. You know, um, I think it will take uh, um, 10 years before, let's say, in the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, you know, we get mm -hmm. uh, uh, every mother, every child access mm -hmm. to the care that they need. Sure. Uh, so I yeah. make a distinction between hospitals. But developed markets. I think we are out prefer. of the gate. We are working well. Okay. Home, let's say, mm. in developed markets, mm. uh, awareness is growing. Yeah. Still a long journey. Yeah. And then in developing markets. Uh, much longer. Much longer. And so much money is needed to build it there. Mm -hmm. Mm. How about you, Andres? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, <coughs> I think uh, we're well on the way to on the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, uh, I think we can do much more as an industry. Maybe we can force it more by in this industrial committees and, and the standards, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I totally agree it's going to be different by different segments of the market, whether you are in, in the developed world, the developing, or even private or, or non-private, and even mm -hmm. by nations, it's going to be a, a little bit, unfortunately, different. Mm -hmm. But I think the commitment starts partly with us mm -hmm. and partly with the providers mm -hmm. and who, everyone. And I think, actually, patients can make a difference here. If patients start to push a l harder on the outcome because they're not really present in many, many environments. Mm -hmm. That can accelerate this one. And I, th I think yeah. this movement includes that and for us Indeed. to put it on the top of our agenda will help. Excellent. Well, I could talk for a lot longer, but the time's up and I want to thank each, and, uh, each of you for uh, contributing for a very lively and fruitful discussion. I'm sure the uh, audience enjoyed it, so let's give our panelists a round of applause. Here.